NGMA Mumbai is proud to present Rumale Channa Basavaya, the painter laureate from Karnataka, for the first time in Mumbai. I invite you to witness the artistic brilliance of this hidden gem of our country. Rumale, an artist, often compared with Van Gogh, but had his own unique Rumale signature style who romantically chronicled the garden city's blossoms of Bengaluru through his vibrant paintings. Rumales works are very sophisticated. They expect revisits. We can look at his works a number of times and come back with a lot of new insights. A plein air artist who has also painted works from nature of landscapes of Karnataka, Sri Lanka, who is revered as artist mentor, a self-taught genius, carving a niche in Indian art. He never went back to traditional artists or he never went to the contemporaries. Uh, handling of watercolor in uh, doing that post-impressionist style of painting. Even Van Gogh didn't do. He did only oil color in that style. But uh, here is uh, genuine proficiency or mastery of handling the medium. That is exceptional and it's a superior quality. Every painting having a story Every line whispering a tale. Once he used to start, suppose sunlight has gone, he used to close and go. And next day he used to come back again at the same time, same place, and continue his work. One small village called Kadime in Kushalnagar. Uh, there is a Kaveri river, we are sitting on the bank of the river, we start doing the sketches. And we have a lot of people who are artists who are painting in Rumale. 30 to 40 years after, we have a lot of people who are painting in Rumale. Unveiling 80 works from Rumale Art House of Sri Rumale Ji for the very first time in NGMA Mumbai. His artwork is the art of peace. Though Rumale Ji's contribution to the art and culture, uh, you know, landscape of Karnataka has been really immense, I think it's time that his artwork should move out outside Karnataka, outside Bangalore, in India as well as uh, abroad. The exhibition is designed chronologically. There are some elements of surprise, biographical section. You are like anyone who painted, uh, who came out of JJ School of Art or who belonged to the Bombay Art Fitter. It's very different. NGMA welcomes you all to an exclusive retrospective of Rumale Chennabasavaya, Varana Maitri. Welcome to Amchi Mumbai. Exhibition dates March 1st to April 15th. Sent shivers down our spine. However, fast forward to the present, we find ourselves at the crossroad where AI has emerged as an indes indispensable ally, transforming the film industry and amplifying creativity on the silver screen. Today, we stand at the cusp of a cinematic revolution where AI is not just a spectator, but a collaborator. Enter Glenn Marshall, an AI artist who uses Open AI's clip to create a short film, The Crow. The AI-made masterpiece soared into new heights by winning the prestigious jury award at the Cannes Short Film Festival. At Avid Learning, we've been exploring the transformative intersection of art and AI. So far, we've decoded its influence in the visual arts, literature, design, and the written word. Today's program is the latest installment in our tech-oriented innovative programming from understanding the changing artistic expressions through the lens of, art, uh, of artificial intelligence. We've only begun to scratch the surface of generative AI's enormous potential. To dig deeper and to unearth the possibilities, we present lights, algorithm, and action, reimagining cinema with artificial intelligence. From script writing to production, from casting to film distribution, and audience engagement, our diverse group of creative and tech experts will decode AI's impact on varied aspects of filmmaking. They will also bring forth the challenges and the ethical considerations while gazing at the developments that await us in the evolving landscape of AI-driven filmmaking. At Avid Learning, we strongly believe in collaboration and are proud to present this evening we're in event in partnership with the National Gallery of Modern Art, NGMA Mumbai, Ministry of Culture, Government of India. And tonight marks event marks a new chapter in AVID's artistic collaboration at the NGMA with the new director, 
Shri Umesh Kumar Rastogi. Thank you to Umesh ji for continuing our ongoing relationship and also to Shruti Das for hosting us uh, today as usual. And now to the task at hand, it gives me great pleasure to welcome on stage our panel of experts. Uh, so please welcome them with a clap when they come up. Co-founder and CTO for a Vishal Bhalla. <laughs> Founder Polkadot Lightbox Smriti Kiran. <laughs> CEO and co-founder The Small Big Idea, Hari Krishnan Pillai. <laughs> Chief Executive Officer of Antimeta, Dev Datta Portnis. And our moderator for the evening, who we have had the pleasure of being our speaker, but today he's our, mo uh, our, mo uh, our moderator, Indian sci-fi creator, screenwriter, and VP of development, Bang Bang Media Corp, Pratik Arora. <laughs> Look forward to an exciting session. Thank you for being here, and over to you, Pratik. Okay. Um. Hi, guys. Am I audible? Yeah. Hey, Patrick. Uh, Thanks everyone for making it out on a Wednesday <laughs> evening in Mumbai. Couldn't have been easy. Um, and thanks to Avid and Asad for letting me moderate this uh, very interesting panel at a very interesting time. Um, there's a lot changing and I'm excited to get into it. We've got a great panel today. Um, also just, guys, I'm moderating for the first time, so let me apologize in advance for many errors I might probably make. There, there it is, there it is. Right, so a little bit context and a little bit about who I am and why I'm doing this. Uh, where, sorry. Oh, right. Right, so my name is Pratik Arora. I am currently VP of development, uh, development not in the technology sense, but more in the storytelling sense. I find stories and try and help them get to screen. So I'm VP of development at a studio called Bang Bang, where we're putting together a slate of uh, feature film and series projects for like global audiences. We're in Mumbai, but we're also in LA, and we're trying to take like Indian stories to the world. India's international storytelling company is the mission and the motto there. Previously, I've been at MTV, and I've run development a comic book company uh, in Bangalore called Graphic India. Uh, but some of you may know me for my other life, which is as an AI artist. Um, been doing this for a couple of years now, and I was lucky that I think I was right time, right place, early in the wave did some work that I thought was very personal, but it sort of resonated with some other people. Um, it's been a couple of years of experimenting with this new medium of AI image making and AI art to do uh, storytelling in genres that haven't really been very popular in India, specifically science fiction, to some extent horror. So I think given the fact that I've been a producer and a writer and, and I'm on the studio side, but I'm also grappling with this new tech every day, it's given me a little bit of a I think maybe a specific insight and a ringside view of all the various revolutions that are about to unfold in this business. Um, so I'm glad to be here. Um, quick state of the union right now. Currently, there's, so what I would say as a headline is that I don't think these tools have came in, come in and disrupted filmmaking or affected filmmaking dramatically just yet. But I feel like where we were with something like AI imaging and mid journey in 2022, we're at the brink of that with AI tools for cinema, video, long form content production. Um, quickly, just to familiarize everyone with the tools, I think Midjourney is probably the most popular right now. It's, it's a it's an text prompt based AI image generation tool which is being used widely already in, in the industries around the world for concept art and world building, to some extent storyboarding, to some extent testing new concepts and ideas. I've been using it for my Instagram work to just get a certain kind of storytelling out there. Uh, there is ChatGPT, obviously, everyone knows ChatGPT. It's not been used from my sort of conversations with writers, people aren't really using it to write their scripts, but often I'm hearing from writers that it's become this brainstorming tool where a sing individual writer is able to kind of almost enlist another writer to work with them. But the most interesting use case I've heard is that one, I'm trying to remember, I, sorry, I don't know the name, but someone said that I asked ChatGPT for five ideas for my story, and then I don't do any of those because that tells me what's obvious and what to avoid. So all of these interesting use cases are emerging for something like ChatGPT. There is uh, Runway and Pika, which are starting to become popular as tools for generating video. They're prompt based, but also a lot of people are using these to feed um, AI generated images into them and then kind of use them to make short format content for like Instagram and YouTube and Reels and stuff like that. There's uh, Topaz Gigapixel, which is a bit of a 
industry secret kind of thing. These are really great upscalers that use AI at their core. Um, so a lot of art upscaling, uh, for especially with the outputs from AI tools, they're not very high res. So Gigapixel has uh, built a great upscaler to get your images to like print quality, studio quality, exhibition quality. I've exhibited, and I've always used upscalers like Topaz. They've also built something for video. I think the newest on the horizon is something called Suno, which is now using um, prompt-based music generation. You can literally like feed in, make me a Bollywood song about aliens who like eating butter chicken and it'll make you a song like that, and like in 60 seconds. Most of it is admittedly cringe, but it's early, right? So the principle to think of that I've seen echoed a lot during uh, all of these conversations that this is the worst these technologies will ever be. So right now the examples are like bad to cringe to like unusable, but they're all getting rapidly better. Um, there's Wonder Dynamics, which is an interesting VFX tool where it kind of lets you film some live action footage and using a combination of some existing technology and sort of cutting edge AI, you can swap out human characters for fully CG characters um, in an hour, which is otherwise a process that would take like days and days of rendering. So it's already being used in the VFX industry a little bit. And then the big one on the horizon, I'm sure everyone's seen the demo videos of Sora. Now, Sora is kind of radical because one, all AI video tools right now give you a four second output. Sora does 60 seconds. They do photoreal coherence. And the most, I think the most exciting emergent property of Sora is that because they've trained it so well and on you know enough data and OpenAI has got some really, really smart people, the smartest people in the world there, they're starting to see physics emerge inside Sora. So one of the examples of they give off the big shortcomings of AI imaging and AI video is that hands are weird or you know like cars move funny and like it doesn't make sense. There's no physics in that world. But in Sora, they're almost starting to see emergent sense of like weight and gravity and physics. So it's not perfect, but it's, it's probably the closest we've been to a new tool coming in and radically changing how films will be made forever. Um, and with this exciting slash scary opening, I'd like to sort of hand it over to the panel to introduce themselves. Uh, maybe Smriti, you can. Hi everyone, thank you so much for coming out to listen to us. Um, definitely listen to them because I know very little about AI and I'm probably here because I made this manual a panel. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I. I uh, have a content company called Polkadot.Slightbox and I'm currently setting up the content studio for a media and entertainment portal called The Swaddle. Uh, we are getting into, we are developing stories uh, for series and films and um, currently we are not using any of these tools but I would like to um, speak about what the mood in the industry is if you're not really sort of deep uh, diving into technicals. What are the creators thinking? What are the people on ground thinking? And there is a lot of, um, I feel, fear and misinformation, uh, which kind of is not letting technology sort of percolate into becoming a usual thing that people would kind of educate themselves in to see whether this actually helps you uh, create better or make systems more efficient, or how does, how does it actually become an ally? What Asad said in his introduction, how do you actually use this as opposed to resist it? So there's a lot of resistance right now because even when you speak about chat GPT, um, nobody says let's you know figure out what chat GPT is and uh, let's put a creative brief in there and then uh, you know start working on this. Um, everybody is like, oh, chat GPT is shit. You know, it's not. It'll take our jobs away now. People are. All the actors are very scared, um, the laws, but nobody is coming, nobody is having a conversation. These are all dinner time conversations because I think, uh, I think I'm seeing the third uh, cycle of tech, um, you know, sort of shifting, a tech shift happening. So what happens is tech is developing every nanosecond. It's not as if every decade somebody comes out with tech and says, okay, now there's an inflection point, but I think it reaches that point where everybody becomes aware and it percolates into uh, usage. So every time an inflection point has come, uh, I think a, the, the fear is what um, uh, leads the conversation uh, and not understanding. So for me, the reason this conversation was very important was 
to talk about the mood in the industry and also to kind of get to know from people here that how does this uh, conversation from fear and misinformation um, go down to actually becoming a conversation that is about knowledge, that is about how do we use this, what is it that you can actually do? Because I think that pipeline is very important for all of these tools to um, start to get used. One example is that I remember, um, you know, when conversations around AI began, and um, there were a lot of film festivals abroad, and there, there were a lot of people who were doing programs that were specifically driven by AI. Um, but um, the conversations always were transference of, uh, you know, what you're currently making um, being made in these new formats that were emerging and not really about how can you create for those specific, um, you know, um, technologies that are emerging and what are the devices that will optimize that technology because how do you create if people are actually going to be watching on devices or watching on mediums that don't support um, the dexterity and the, the, the brilliance of that particular technology and that's why that's been you know developing or at least coming into a common um, arena where people would know more about it. Um, so I'm gonna hand it over to um, the more knowledgeable people on this panel <laughs> to lead this. So firstly, thanks for having me here. I'm actually quite humbled to be around uh, such experienced folks here. So uh, a little bit about uh, if you can play across my slide. So I think everyone would have heard about this, like knowledge is uh, right at your fingertips, or like you can just get information by a button click. But does that actually hold true? So if you look at the internet content, like ha more than half of it, it's in English. The next be best is like 7% in Russian and five around 5 in Spanish. And when it comes to Indian languages, it's less than one. So like Hindi being the most popular is like point 0.1. So Indic languages are like even less. So, uh, but there's a growing demand of like people who want to consume vernacular con content, right? So uh, these are some numbers that back it. So uh, we f uh, felt that there's a gap between the desired content that's created and what is to be consumed. So a gap to fill this gap, localization is like a key. So with that in mind, we set out to build this product. Uh, can you play the next slide? So uh, we are building Furi. It's a multimodal content localization platform. By multimodal, I mean any form of digital content, be it text, audio, or video. Uh, what it does is like you upload it on our platform, uh, select the language, select the voice, and it automatically converts or transforms it for you. So behind the scenes, there is a generative AI algorithm, not just one. There are like 13, 14 different algorithms in play. Uh, I'll just give a quick demo of what we're building. This is like a very latest research. Mm, I don't know. All I know is I have to catch an Austrian Airlines flight tomorrow morning at 9.30, and I don't really have enough money for a hotel, so I was just going to walk around, and it'd be a lot more fun if you came with me. And if I turn out to be some kind of psycho, you know, you just get on the next train. I don't know. I just know that I have to catch an Austrian Airlines flight tomorrow morning at 9.30, and I don't have enough money for a hotel, so I was just going to walk around, and if I turn out to be some kind of psycho, you know, you just get on the next train. उससे अच्छा होता कि तुम मेरे साथ आ जाती और अगर मैं किसी प्रकार का साइको निकला तो तुम अगले ही ट्रेन में चढ़ जाते ही केम वॉकिंग अप बिसाइड मी यू नो एंड आई टोल्ड हिम यू नो यू शुड डेट एमा बिकॉज़ शी हैज़ अ बिग क्रश ऑन मी एंड ही टर्न्ड टू मी एंड सेड और वो मेरे पास आया मैंने उससे कहा कि तुम्हें उसके साथ मिलना चाहिए क्योंकि वो तुम्हें पसंद कर रही है लेकिन उसने मुझसे कहा so uh, basically this is just like a very recent work. So if you notice like the Hindi female voice is like not up to the mark, but what we've tried to do is match the timber or the unique characteristic of the actor. So if you notice, I don't know if you notice the English actor is actually, the, the Hindi voice is kind of similar. Uh, so, and then apart from that, there's also a prosody, like a bit technical, like so the rhythm, tone, intonation, or the way you express. So that's also being matched somewhat. Again, this is like a work in progress. Uh, so sorry, just for the audience yeah. super quick. If you could just break down in like 30 seconds, what was the process like? How much time did it take? Because I think that's where the real leap is. Yes, um, yeah. So basically, if you go about like the traditional dubbing uh, pipeline, it takes like roughly like 30 days or so. Sorry, yeah, it takes about 30 days or so. You need to like firstly get the actor's dates, then you need to book a rental studio, and then you go about, then the post-processing and other right. stuff happen, right? So this takes time. 
with this kind of software in place like all you need is like kind of the original source clip mm -hmm. you kind of separate the background music or the noise and then with few clicks like you can kind of tune how much you want to retain the timber or the prosody part right and then it's like in a matter of minutes you can get that so it's like weeks or months to minutes yes, essentially yes okay yeah. right and so yeah that's where the big leap is right and even though the audio quality obviously it's getting there but yes already that's huge. so what we are trying to do unique or distinct is if you would have seen like a lot of these dubbing and other studios are there available in like famous languages like the European languages and all that right because there's a lot of data a lot of research being done but what about Indian languages right so that is the space we are exploring so this is just one prototype like where we're trying to do uh, English to Hindi we already have Hindi or like any language to English ready and by English I mean Indian English not US or UK English so this is the space we are exploring and uh, can you play the next yeah, so f just to break it down even further, so speech synthesis, like this falls under the bracket of speech synthesis. Uh, it involves voice cloning, so basically matching your voice. Emotional speech, like how can you make the speech a bit more expressive? Can the uh, voices uh, shout or can it cry, right? So these kind of expressive uh, speech. And then how can you make it multilingual? Right now, like no one talks like in just one language, right? You will intersperse uh, words from another language like uh, that's called code switching so uh, or you can say a sentence in English then follow up with with an Hindi sentence also right so how do you make it multilingual so the, these three components are important and then why is it needed so you can preserve a person's voice you can a uh, clone a uh, actor's voice as I showed uh, and then with this you can reach a global audience with like an increased engagement like Although there are platforms or there are videos which use stock voices, you can convert a video, get the voice, uh, sorry, get, the, get it done in like another language. But will the audience actually consume it? Will they retain? Like basically beyond a minute or so, you will figure out, oh no, is this like too monotonous? I'll drop off. So that is why it's needed. And ultimately what it does is builds a more inclusive and a connected world. So with that mission, uh, can you play the next slide? So that's uh, the team, uh, the two of us are kind of co-founders. We have a unique uh, complementary skill set. I have a background of natural language understanding. My co-founder has a background of digital signal processing. So we kind of married uh, these two skill sets to build this product. And our mission is to democratize engaging content creation. And uh, yeah, re feel free to reach out. I'm happy to take questions. Yeah, thank Great. you. Great, uh, Hari? Hi. <coughs> Hello, Audible. Okay, hi. My name is Hari Krishnan Pillai. I'm the founder CEO of The Small Big Idea. We are a quintessential digital agency, so we are a marketing company. We come in after the films are made, right? And we decide how do we go ahead and promote it so that we reach out to the right audience. So that's really our job. Uh, Mr. Clicker. So uh, just to give context, because, because we're discovering films, uh, these are the films that we've worked on over the years, some of them. So basically, if you've seen any promotional content on your social feed, otherwise, you know, there's a possibility that we would have played a very important role in doing this, right? So when it comes to any technology, uh, and I'll try and, try and be as basic as possible, not because you won't comprehend, because I think that's the best way to talk. So there are two things, right? One is the cute stuff, like really cute stuff. And then there is the things that make business impact, right? So at TSBI, we've done the entire, I mean, we are exploring both spectrums. So what would be cute is, you know, doing something, brands want to do something with Gen AI, right? That's the cute stuff. And then the base business stuff is something that will help you reduce cost, scale up, and be faster. Something that he's doing right now, right? So that's the spectrum one needs to understand. AI is applied here, and AI is also applied here. So I'll tell you where, where we do impact, and I'll also show you the cute stuff. So that's, that's impact. So what we did is we built something called as ACE. It stands for Advanced Content Evaluation. A lot of jargons, but I tell you what it does net-net. It will tell you what kind of content in imagery, voice, sound, duration, volume is most likely to work on a platform. So it will tell you a shirtless actor in an orange background talking in Hindi and funny is more likely to work than a tall actor wearing a brown shirt with a horse in the background, right? I mean, as, as awkward it could get, right? So it basically throws data to you so that you can say, hey, I need units like this 
which can which can then be used for prompts to tell your Gen AI engine what to create, right? So it is Gen AI, Gen AI creates. This tells you what prompts you could give to create. Now we have applied this in massive, uh, you know, forms, especially in the broadcast and the OTT industry, to make social content more efficient. So what we have seen is almost 300% more reach and impressions bases the kind of duration, the kind of language that these images or these videos are recommending that we do. So this is the big, big business uh, impact and this will only get better. Uh, how, what, is, what is the extrapolation of this idea is uh, the tool telling you, hey, there's a possibility that these kind of stories might actually work. Of course, I still believe I mean, be, being a purist, that you need a writer to do that job, <laughs> right? I truly believe it. <laughs> but it will at least help you, right? So you book not to do from book. You can tell this to do it, right? So that's that's what I think this will do, right? And then, of course, uh, you know, there are cute stuff. So we have, so we were one of the early guys who did NFTs. I mean, I'm sure everybody did this. The entire uh, entire industry got excited about this. That we will NFT, we will make money, right? So we were we were actually the ones who did image manipulation, dropped NFTs. We did all of that. We've built metaverses, built used you know imaginative AI to build uh, metaverses to build the entire environment. Uh, we, again, very very basic stuff. We have put people on press conferences where actors have spoken to journalists from one place to the other. Again, you know, and of, and recent more recently. Uh, because there were no, the actors were not available, so school shoot schedule was done. We've actually also done, you know, generative AI posters for a recent film called Merry Christmas, right? So that's that's the stuff that we've done. We've done for sports, we've done for artists, we've done for shows. So that's pretty much what it is. So that for me, marketing uh, after the content is done, business impact content, right? How do you bring large, scalable business impact? And then, of course, there are the other stuff, right? So that's me. Thanks. Great. Thanks. Uh, uh, hi guys, uh, thank you for having me on this panel and it's lovely to be over here with all these esteemed panelists and I'm glad I'm speaking right at the end because I now know what I should not say <laughs> or faff about. Uh, so yeah, that's me. Uh, I'm all of those things mentioned over there and I'm currently working with a creator tech company called Animata. This is my introduction and I'll speak a little bit more about my company. Uh, before I get into this, I just want to say from an AI, my perspective on this panel, I'm going to be speaking from three perspectives. First and foremost, I am a very active Hindi cinema bhakt. So I've been watching cinema over the years and uh, you know, one of the things while he was speaking right now, a thought came to my mind back in the 1980s when Yashraj was going through its worst phase and uh, Yashopra was making this film called Channi and everybody had told him, this is action film. Up, kya, in the name of violence, your film has got one slap. Some of his most uh, regular distributors, and because he's had 1980s were horrible for Yashra, that's when Aditya Chopra was a teenager, and we know that history. I mean, some people do. Uh, and then he said, But this is my conviction, I'm going to make it. And Chani literally was like a slap on those action films in that sense of the term, and it changed the trend entirely. So I am a data skeptic in that sense of the term. Uh, when I said, and the same thing happened again in 1994 when the Rajshri's were making Hum Aapke People were like, this is a video bana rakha hai. This film is going to be a disaster. And we all know what happened after that. So that's one perspective that I would be speaking from. My background has always been business. I have been, uh, I mean, on some level I can relate to him because I've been on the marketing business side. On some level I can relate to her because I'm a wannabe writer myself. Uh, let's talk, you and you as well. Uh, and right now I'm developing, I mean rather I'm working on the business side of a creator tech company where I can relate with him as well. So that's going to be one aspect of that I will be straddling across. And the third perspective which I play, so I am the father of a teenager and a teenager uh, who are right now in the right age, ripe, wrong, right, all sorts of ages when it comes to AI exposures. So my daughter will come and tell me, why are you taking so much effort to write? Have you tried chat GPT? And uh, I have to tell my son, please don't plagiarize your assignments. But he's right now writing a novel along with Chat GPT. But I'm like, you know, it's better than watching other people's shit on YouTube. Sorry, pardon my language. Uh, and I'm running a creator tech company. A little bit about the company that I'm running right now. Uh, so this is the company that we run called Animeta. It's a it's a creator tech company that's trying to revolutionize the creator economy 
through technology. We all know that in the pandemic, YouTube creators, Instagram creators, TikTok creators have changed the game, and that's what the creator economy is about. It's one of the first industries that has crossed a 100 billion mark in about seven, eight years worldwide. So it's growing, and everybody is a creator in that sense of the term. So when you have numbers, you need data, and that's when AI comes in really, really handy. Uh, I'm an engineer by qualification, by the way, but just on paper. Uh, so what we essentially do, we, our first product is this uh, influencer marketing platform and social commerce platform, which we've built with the help of, uh, I mean, AI and a truckload of HI as well, because as long as the HI drives the AI, AI is fun in that sense. Uh, and this is what we offer. Um, sorry, one sec. Where did it go? Yeah, this is what we offer when it comes to influencer marketing, all of these things. Uh, so a full spectrum campaigns, we're trying to just put in a certain degree of science because what happens is while the first example that I opened with is very charming because back in 1989 when Chandni was made, there was Yash, one Yash Chopra. I mean, there's still, there is only one Yash Chopra. But there are multiple others who want to try and thanks to the little device that all of us carry, each one of us has the power to do something today. So it doesn't mean that we're going to crush their aspirations saying, Are tu Yash Chopra nahi hai. So AI in that sense, it's truly democratizing. When I s look at my children, I'm sometimes amazed the kind of speed with which they understand these tools or they'll teach me, Are Baba, you're not, you're not cool at all. I'll tell you how to use this editor. And I'm like zapped, how the hell did they know this? So that's where the world is headed and we have to embrace it. Uh, my skepticism for data obviously comes in from a certain position because you never know, the soul does not come in with that. I mean, we were discussing the other day, Pratik and I, and a lot of his artwork, I saw him like blown away entirely in terms of the way he's imagined those things. And I actually specifically want to ask you this question. I know you're the moderator, but you have to speak as well. Please How did you put in soul in those images? Because it's one of the AI-generated things that I've seen where there is soul. Okay. Uh, um, yeah, that's, that, that's me and now over to you. Heavy question, but look, I think now having done this for two years and had many sleepless nights and really n nice DMs from people who think this is the death of art and cinema, you, you start thinking about the role, right? Ultimately, after like two years of thinking, what I realized is that look, whatever the tool, until the day we became cyborgs and fused with machines, it's still human beings making things for human beings, right? Everything else is intermediate. Everything else is a tool. It's not, you're n I'm not a machine making for another machine or a machine making for a person. I'm a person making something for a another person. As long as it speaks to me emotionally, there's a good chance it'll speak to someone else because I'm also a human being. That you know of, I mean, any but anyway. For so sure. I think so that's, I'm, I'm representing the machines. But I feel like it's really about that and I think that's what someone has to, you know, what people have to remember. And uh, are you, are there more slides? No, I'm done. Okay, that's a perfect segue into, okay, guys, let's just jump into it now, right? Uh, quick time check, we're at 7.10. We have till about 8. Um, so let's kind of get into it and, and like maybe we'll keep it a little snappy now. So look, I think from bouncing off from your question, right? You're talking about human intelligence, artificial intelligence, algorithmic intelligence. And with all of these tools, you know, my, my position is that they are still tools. But a lot of people are uncomfortable by how evolved and these tools are and how kind of easy it is to get started with them. A, a constant accusation is that, hey, you're not making this, the AI is making this. It kind of really gets my goat. I don't agree with it, but I'm interested in thinking uh, and hearing from you guys, and this is a, to the panel, what do you think that means for like human creativity? And, and you know, how as human creators now with these really evolved slash easy seeming tools, you still kind of preserve your point of view. How do you, how do you grapple with that, right? Right now it's a bit of a problem of plenty, it's maybe, is it making it too easy? How do you think creators navigate that? Swati, yeah. Oh, okay, all right. All right, you know, uh, <coughs> let's talk about creators, right? I mean, sure. uh, let, uh, most great literature mm -hmm. that we have read or consumed is actually fiction, correct? Uh, I mean, I'm not, not making a religious statement, but a lot of the there's, literature. There's some great non-fiction. Yeah, yeah, it is fine. actually fiction. So let's let's look at, I mean, let's track back a few years back. This man named Stanley created characters mm -hmm. who today became becomes a great movie, right? Now, mm -hmm. when I'm sure when he sketched something and people were making films, motion pictures, where people, real people are walking, and he was making comic, I'm sure somebody would have said, yeah, what are you doing? You're drawing, painting something. 
right what life does that have in comparison to this man this woman running in front of a moving camera and we're making a film now look at what that character what franchise that character and that imagination made so for me today for the creators who i'm assuming there is i think there is a large wave of creators that's going to come in who who cannot act in front of the camera who can't dance in front of camera who can't do tiktok videos but can imagine and they will use these tools yeah and they will use these tools to create fictional characters who have powers who have sentiments who have vulnerabilities and create series series over a period of time for me to get emotionally attached to the character and over a period of time i might not i love rajni khan but rajni khan might not be my favorite actor it might be that character correct so i think it is just a device i mean ai uh, is a device that is giving somebody who doesn't have the ability to perform to create a character and perform right and that's what's going to happen and it happened it has happened always happened J people used to make drawings for uh, for print ads mm -hmm. photoshop came in you used technology and made it faster now this has come through you're going to make it even faster it's just that so i i think the figment of imagination will be alive a human being is going to be alive i think the characterization is going to just open up and i think you're right also what it will do probably is that new forms of creation and performance will open up like i know that i'm suddenly very interested in like acting for motion capture yeah. because like if you can create these kind of 3d model rigs using ai and unreal engine you still need to like perform them and i think in your superhero example there's a great i think it's a great north star for where a lot of this will go because if you think about like the marvel universe today um iron man is the character but he's also robert downey jr yeah. so it's it's like in that way it's cutting edge but it's also as old as history yeah. where there have been iconic characters written by iconic writers playwrights yeah. and then there have been iconic performances of these characters yeah. right someone did romeo and juliet on west end and then those performances are iconic someone performs so you know it's i think that's going to emerge a lot more um quickly smriti you had something to add no actually i pretty much wanted to say this and i also wanted to say that basically it just opens up i think the um the economy um changes like if you if you um have somebody who's writing at one point of time and then a technology came in that actually put that on screen suddenly the ecosystem just shifts in terms of uh the economies of scale how does that work the new audiences open up but i also feel that what we really need to focus on is we can talk about what this will do and how uh this is going to change creation but what does that mean for the industry what does that mean for an actor like you just mentioned robert downey junior um when um the strike was going on all the actors were very worried about what happens to the usage um uh, of actors by big studios and how does ai affect you know their livelihood and the landscape that they operate in so i feel that uh, like i said when i uh, you know opened the discussion that um how does this percolate what is the where is the knowledge conduit for all of this for a working professional within the industry to kind of figure out where this is going where this is headed how is this going to affect my daily job um and how will these tools even legally for that matter uh, how does the landscape completely shift because it will shift you know there is no truly, point truly. in resisting this so now the conversation really needs to shift to how and not will it or how will it of course it will but even the advancements that have happened even the tools that have come in how do they percolate within mm -hmm. my normal working environment right. and how do i use it and where do i go to kind of you know figure out what my next steps are is what is become important i don't think that gets spoken about as much as what will this do to creation right so just you know building off that let's say i i buy your point and i think we're seeing it in action i've been able to let's say create more stories or story based media of whatever form even just on instagram now maybe in 6 months i can do it on youtube so what's really happening is that the kind of really storytelling based with like complex stories and characters kind of media that was so far very difficult to create for the youtube business model or the instagram business model we'll see a lot more of so you know imagine someone who's till yesterday uh, had the money to make a vlog will in 2 years be able to make something that looks like a marvel movie 
So that means that there'll be like this flood of all kinds of content, good, bad, ugly. In that, in that situation, how does, like to just building off your question, how does distribution change? Who becomes like the new, new gatekeeper of this content? I, that's a bad word. But there will be some kind of gatekeeping that will kick in. Uh, but the industry logic currently, which is based on, let's say, a level of scarcity of a certain kind of story, will abruptly shift, like it happened with music. So in that landscape, how does the, the best content rise to the top? Who identifies it? Who aggregates it? What happens to the business? Uh, maybe they've yeah, and also just to adding to that, since you're answering, we've, you and I also spoke about how generally in the Indian industry, there's a big sense of upheaval right now. There's a lot of structural shift. So maybe how does that tie into all of that? So you know, it, there are multiple aspects in this and a couple of words that you've taken, I'm gonna start off with Please, those. Yeah. Uh, because now the question is who decides what's best? The democratization, the beauty of it is, and I'm trying to take it back because there's a lot of criticism about AI taking away jobs and stuff. Now, if you look at it, I'm gonna take a slightly anthropological stance over here from the perspective of evolution of society. Let's look at Hindi cinema because that's my reference point. So back in the days in the when India just got its independence, women were not women from respectable families were not allowed to work in cinema. At that point in time, a woman from a relatively not so affluent background, Madhubala, came in. Ethereal beauty, it's been about what, I think some 50, 80 years since her death. Still, she's the epitome of beauty of Indian cinema. Eventually, the industry evolved. There were more people. Television, etc., offered more avenues. All these singing and dancing shows created a lot more talent right. in that sense. And now with social media, and AI I'm saying is uh, the next step of social media in that sense, because everybody has been empowered. Everybody is a creator mm -hmm. in some way or the other. Right. Even if it is for my 10 Instagram followers, it is I have an audience kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. So the definitions of best, et cetera, have completely changed. Because it's Correct. so subjective, all of us are subject to it. And where is this criticism coming from? From the elite few who were like art in that sense was a privileged medium. Now everybody can take a dent at it. There's a point in time when people said dogs and Indians not allowed. So today when a person of Indian origin is sitting as uh, the number one person for UK, Obviously, the UK guys are not going to like it. Today, when we talk, I'm not trying to make any political stance over here, but when we talk about, say, 100 smart cities in India, we're sitting in one of the most premium districts in the whole country. This portion will not like it because today I was exclusive. Now, oh, all of them are equal to me. So the definitions of best change in that sense. So who's the gatekeeper? One really doesn't know. From the perspective, I think she made a very val valid point in terms of how the industry evolves because the more number of consumers, uh, I mean, if you just take a look at what NFT and all is a, it's a cute thing in that sense, but the people who are immersed into it, I mean, I happen to witness uh, a, a BGMI national uh, level tournament in Bangalore a couple of months ago. It was crazy. The indoor stadium in Bangalore was packed with- You mean Battlegrounds Mobile? Battlegrounds Mobile. Yeah. So that's, that's this PUBG, everyone knows PUBG. It's yeah. now BGMI. Esports so is a thing. Yeah, the, the esports finale. I was uh, fortunate to witness the magic. I some I'm someone who does not like games at all. I'm like, kya bevkufi kar rahe? Why are you wasting your life? We'll we'll play together. I'll teach. We'll uh, play together. You'll teach me. I'll teach. Uh, then I'll be cool for my son. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say that uh, you know, not to flex my ignorance, but uh, I just uh, got to know that there are actually esports stars and tournaments because a friend of mine is married to a, a esports star. Wow. The and prize money was. I thought all of them. Sorry, uh, <laughs> I have to ask. I thought all the esports star was sixteen, like so. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently not. Okay. <laughs> That's he's great. Definitely but you're right. I mean, it ties into the larger point of our understanding of media storytelling. It's what changing entirely. Like an often quoted statistic internationally is that the revenues of video gaming internationally. I don't think. I know, I'm not sure if that includes India specifically, but the revenue that video games as an industry is making around the world is now multiple times that of Hollywood, right? Yet, we don't have an Oscars of video games. Some of them are such sophisticated storytelling. If anyone's seen the Last of Us series on like HBO, apparently the game that's based on is even more like immersive, emotional, all of that, right? So there's always that generational legacy bias of what's Absolutely. good art, right? I mean, it's amazing to me that we don't have a video game section at the Oscars right now. I mean, that should have happened like a decade ago, right? No, so this event that I was telling you about, the prize money was, by the way, one and a half crores. Whoever won that thing. I saw 10,000 people. They all looked like they would be 16, 18. 
the way they were cheering and this is the day i'm telling you the date as well when virat kohli broke his jinx and had his mm -hmm. 100th 100 or whatever right. that was the right. day i was in that event they didn't care what's going on virat's broken those 10000 people in the stadium were focused on that so this is what i'm trying to get into there are these multiple niches that are coming in right. we have what 7 billion on this earth right now all of us so if these cohorts are getting developed yes. in that sense it is great for the industry standards obviously get pushed on whichever was a dominant section i'm, I'm going to bring again a controversial point before i finish uh, we've all heard about this film called animal i'm yet i've yet not watched it but come on i'm sure you i watched. haven't it's i okay. have i've seen it i can admit to you it no i i have someone who used to die watching if i get a 3 o'clock show and not a 12 o'clock show but i haven't watched animal yet okay. but the point it is everybody is talking about how technically brilliant it is because it is competing talking to the audiences who are used to all these sophistications on different forms so it's pushing the envelope of creativity and ai is also one leg in that direction one more step in that direction I i've spoken a lot i love sorry. you i love that you said that it's kind of i think you're right in the world of entertainment there are like multiple revolutions happening all at the same time so very bringing it very specifically to the indian context or let's say the feature film production and distribution context where are you seeing that headed i think uh, one thing i also want to say because we were speaking about stardom that um, you know and gatekeeping i feel that uh, you know we have a very um, siloed idea of stardom we only think about uh, movie stars but the fact of the matter is that the world has changed as far as stardom is concerned completely um just uh, you know i mean you learn from your family more than you learn from anywhere else i've got two nieces one is 17 and one is 11 i work in film uh my parents are movie buffs and you know our world because we grew up at a certain time our idea of stardom is film television all of that and of course sports stars and politicians and everything but my 11 year old niece has a youtuber that she uh, knows his video is going to drop on tuesday and on friday and she has no idea um the people that i interact with who i chat with she has never asked me i want a picture with this person or i want to meet this person so um she has no clue and neither does the 17 year old who's um uh, you know who's studying abroad who's probably has more understanding of uh, movies and series but they're not interested and this is not because of the fact that they're not consuming it's just that there's a massive shift and we guys do not know about that or at least are not capitalizing on it that the movie stars might not be as popular or as big a uh, No, as we think are. they are like you see in reality shows right now sorry to interrupt you yeah. but when you look at these shows like khatro ke khiladi or dance yeah. diwane when they get these social media stars again not mentioning any names because it gets controversial but a lot of times your main bollywood celebrity who's judging or hosting it has say 3 million followers and your yeah. participants have 30 million followers so what kind of a skewed this thing are we talking about those yard six have collapsed and the other thing that is going to shift apart from stardom um i i think that's going to start to happen and which means that your economics will shift i think the other thing is that um the more um tech develops or ai becomes refined mm -hmm. see already the algos the um algorithms were deciding in a way because that is what executives and corporates look at when they are looking at broad strokes you know green lighting things or putting um, you know what is the basis of decisions i mean apart from your individual intuition and wanting to work with a creator or taking a punt on people but um, when you're actually justifying to a studio as to how much money will you put in this story or why you should green light a particular subject you are actually looking at data you are deciding according to the data at least data is playing a major role in that you know you might not go with that decision but at least that is the basis of a sense a reasoning that you will start to you know mount a project on so i feel that that will also keep on getting more refined as we go along as tech develops So then, uh, I think Vishal, you're trying. Yeah, to and actually, that's what I wanted to highlight. Basically, you mentioned the gatekeeping algos being like so common. Like if everyone is using. Okay, let me let me clarify. I'm not yeah. on the side of gatekeeping or gatekeepers. Yeah. But I think people conflate gatekeeping with curation. I think gatekeeping is bad. Curation is not. Right. And I think in the 
eat off like glut of content it's important to like filter out what is what so just yeah yeah, yeah. so that's what like so ultimately data will also become a moat right so if someone has access to good quality content or is making a particular niche genre then you are like kind of mastering that so right now we are only consuming as a consumer tech like the end product mm-hmm. but if you're building it ground up mm-hmm. if you have access to that so you're sitting on a gold mine basically so i think data will become a moat along with the algos being like the gatekeeper or whatever so like doing a little bit of speculation here like let's say yashra's got its entire library of films yes tomorrow they could train yashra gpt and then make infinite yes. yashra films so forever yeah so yeah. that's what is actually happening You'd love that. Uh, in in if you look at like uh, these models right like mm-hmm. people are training it for legal documents for medical so you have a med tech gpt right. or like legal tech gpt right so similar thing could happen which is like sci-fi gpt mm-hmm. or romcom gpt whatever right so, so i think yeah so data will be a moat that's great just yeah. bouncing off that very quickly to hari now given all of this big stuff happening if you're still and you work with a lot of young creators and you work in the industry so if you're a young writer director actor anyone starting out in this kind of film 5 years ago i would have been said easy to say that hey i want to go to mumbai and make films it's not so simple anymore i want to go to mumbai and do one of 100 things so now ac- this acceleration of so many multiple revolutions and disruptions in what stardom what success what does a young creator today do is do you kind of not think of or not care about kind of working with the old like the old school studios does everyone say that now i have to become a quote unquote influencer in my domain or is there still some value to kind of let's say proving your skill online and then going out and reaching out to people who are actually producers does a does an influencer creator who uses ai to do romcoms eventually go to a yashraj and say that let's make this correct uh i think a creator has to start thinking of their social as their resume mm. correct the moment you start thinking like that you make some great content now now look at what influencers are doing they are not buying into you because you know you're creating content and you're one amongst millions they are buying into you because you have 4 million people following you consuming your content every day so there are thou please understand this creator ecos- ecosystem is massive out of which like in all industry the top one layer makes all the money right the rest is still struggling and fighting so when because we're discussing business dynamics this this inflection of AI in content becoming business will happen when in this country of 1.3 billion people the person who's ready to pay 200 rupees and go watch a film is willing to watch that content the day that happens that oh he's a great creator you're making some fabulous things i've been following you for 2 3 years if you make a film i'm going to pay take 200 bucks take my entire family make it 800 bucks and go and watch that film the day that happens the real gatekeeper is the big producer the big studio with all the money will come to you buy your rights and he'll release it and you will need Excellent. that platform right Amen. so so for me i mean any creator who's here start building your resume on social start creating great stuff build a big fan base fan base because believe me they're not just biting in your talent they're biting in your talent and they're biting in your reach they will take it and you need the studio to amplify you to take you to large levels and that's why all your top creators are gym ja rahe weight loss kar rahe aur kal film mein aayenge right that's what's going to happen so basically he's just increased the anxiety in the room if anyone was telling you slow living get off social media just start creating <laughs> also <laughs> yeah yeah thanks for saying that guys also i'm nowhere close to 4 million followers please follow me on instagram i'm just at like 50000 which is like i'm I, it's not paying my rent guys please like please yeah um, okay that's great thanks guys i think please please yeah i'm sorry i'm talking a lot uh, but you know based on what hari just said a thing came to my mind because we've built uh, an influencer marketing platform this is not from the film perspective i'm talking about the business angle mm-hmm. now so we were in conversations one of the largest advertisers in the country they spend about 3 to 4000 crores a year on advertising across all media and spend influencer marketing how do we bring in science what's the roi efficiency is what we were talking about so as he rightly said i think 94% of whatever indian creator economy is google puts out this study that we contributed 10000 crores to india's gdp that's their uh, press line 
and uh, of that about 90%, 95% goes to a handful. We can actually count them. Uh, they make so much more than a lot of television or film celebrities in that sense. And the problem that brands are facing right now, because that's one of the tech solutions that we are developing, we're using AI in that space. They're like, up creator to lay out data se match karke. I mean, you can get someone because, I mean, if you look at some of the Bhojpuri content and stuff also, crazy, there are 3 billion, 4 billion views for songs which we would not even call cringe. We'll have to invent a word that makes cringe sound premium. But 3 billion views. There are There is content like that. I, I don't want to say the names sitting on the panel. I can tell you some of the song titles I later. I can, I can say them. I listen to them all the time. Like <laughs> I, I, I love that. It's, it's, yeah. So no, what I'm trying to say is, but they are not brand friendly, right? You can't go to a brand manager who's come from one of the IIMs uh, well, now we can't say from Bandra or South Bombay or South Delhi, across the country, but from one of the IMs, even maybe one of the smaller IMs. But they still don't get, oh, because Bhojpuri is not cool, right? Because I, I belong over here. So then, how do I talk about ROI? But I'm going to those same set of creators which he spoke about who hog the money, but they're not giving the ROI. The Bhojpuri guy, if there's a Bolero Chalale, some video that has come in, that, that's a name that I can take, has got billions of views. Now, so, but it's not commissioned by Mahindra. But tomorrow, if a brand, and that's an insight, jo Bharat hai, jo India se thoda alag hai, in that sense of the term, wahan pe ye chal rahe, and what about the growth curve for so many people who've just seen, like, kal tak paisa hi nahi tha, aur sidha hat mein 5G phone aagaya. So when you, when there's the, not that curve, a lot of us over here in this room have seen dial phone, trunk call, then the QWERTY mobile, then Blackberry, then touch screen. So, those are also factors where AI, the whole menace aspect comes in. And I, I think I should just shut up. I'm speaking a lot. No, no, you're right. I think. Yes, please, if you want. No, so the R. The, it wasn't commissioned by Mohindra. And to, so that, but that becomes a case study, right? Because we also have. When a couple of years ago, Mai Jhandu Bam Hui Darling Tere Liye came in, it worked. Again, it wasn't commissioned by Zandu Bam, but Fevicol was a paid one is what people kept talking oh, about. Okay. So those are insights that work. And ROI actually comes in from the fact, Abhi, now we're moving, the other product that we're developing is about social commerce. Because brands are saying, it's very, so I had a conversation with one of the OTT players recently. Uh, and their pet gripe was, we got one of the top creators for one of their programs. Uh, she makes incredible content, I'm not quoting her again. She said, the marketing piece got 3 million views, but my program didn't even get 10,000 views. <laughs> so that's again a telling sign. Conversion. Conversion. Because what is happening is something what he was talking about, are you saying content marketing PC is so entertaining, bana diya hai na? why do I need to see the show? So a couple of years ago when I actually was working in film marketing, we were working on a film where I had actually scripted the making of of the film in a in an interactive manner, which mm -hmm. kind of tells me the story. And everybody in my team, all my peers were like, se ye kar and my boss came in and she just slapped me. No, not physically, <laughs> literally. Uh, because the fact of the matter, she's put out the whole film in the making. Who will come and watch the film after this? And I was like, really? I mean, I love cinema so much, I'll watch making of, I'll go this, I'll go watch the film. But people are getting satiated and that's where the ROI for entertainment, ROI, that's the problem. Right, okay, so I think use this point about, again, this, all, everything we're talking about comes back to the point that there is so much changing, right? So I think to address your point about Bojpuri and not being considered cool, I think one of the big enablers, one of the big things that will change with, let's say, when it gets easier to produce a certain quality and a level of content and distribute is, is that the, the arbiters of cool get, get much wider. Once upon a time, Heartland was not considered cool in the urban centers of consumption, right? Once upon a time, street rap was not considered cool. And like the famous story, if everyone's seen Gully Boy or the, or the videos that preceded it, Nezi was kind of the guy who sparked that wave and he shot this video on an iPad and put it on YouTube and just organically it kind of blew up. And from that point, now you have an entire industry. So I think that's point well taken. I feel like this, who gets to say what's cool is kind of really broadening up. But, but just bringing it back to, let's say, the specifically the industry context. Now, I have a big fear. I think what happens in India has happened before is that either these major revolutions just pass us by or we're like very late to the party. Um, and so as someone being in the business and kind of really invested in it and having friends there, I don't want that to happen this time. I don't want this revolution in AI sort of to pass us by, especially because the industry is growing otherwise, there's all of this appetite for new ideas, yet, like you said, and I'm bringing it back to where you started, that there is this hesitation slash paranoia slash 
you know, it's in the future, we don't have to classic, kal dekh lenge, jab aega, tab dekh lenge, kind of mentality that is very Indian. And I think that's because, like, Sora, for example, which is this very capable seeming video tool, is not released yet, and it's, AI is not really in Bollywood's business yet. Yeah. It's not, but I think it will be in like two years. So I think the question then is that, to this panel, and just for everyone to think about, is that how do we make sure that we're kind of laying the groundwork for that to be seen, like you said, as an ally, because there are big thorny questions. There are big thorny questions, especially about jobs, because in our industries there are a lot of uh, unstructured or loosely structured employment that has no one is to one corollary for like um, employment in the AI age, right? I, and I think it's constantly clear that the if you're a brand name in the business, you're fine. But a lot of the business is not that. So how do we as an industry collectively make sure we're ahead of that curve, ahead of that conversation, and don't act in like this reactionary way where AI is bad, but also don't ignore the concerns, like what needs to be done? Um, I think educate yourself. I think it's very, very important to kind of educate yourself. You can't resist this because it's, it, is going to pa it is going to come in. Um, and um, there's no point in resisting it. Um, you have to stay curious. I know it sounds uh, crazy when I say this, but the fact of the matter is that the pandemic uh, almost made it uncool for everyone to, you know, people used to turn around and flex and say, I'm so technologically challenged and this, that and the other. Now you can't, to be, you can't afford to be technologically challenged. You could work because there was like, you know, AI and there was tech available that could enable work happening. So I feel that instead of resisting and instead of thinking that if we resisted hard enough and bad enough, it is not going to kind of affect us. I think for me, I mean, that's my personal point of view. Educating yourself is the best way of at least the first steps in going about it and learning about it. I think we just don't have that appetite for learning in general in terms of figuring out where all AI affects us, what is coming in, how those tools can be used. We are just having very superficial conversations um, about how AI is going to take over and what is going to happen. We have a very terminator understanding of AI. And I think we need to move beyond that and kind of see what is happening in the world because that's going to happen whether we like it or not. Yeah. See, uh, we have to understand that use of AI is not for painting. It is the discussion is on business impact. Yeah. India is a unit economics market. You have to crack a technology that cracks the unit economics of five laborers doing something at X, X amount. Laborers could be at any class, right? Five people doing it at any amount. Are you able to do it cheaper, better, faster than those five people? So you have to understand that technology in the West and technology in India or anything, any adoption works very, very differently. India is a market of unit economics. I think the adoption will immediately happen the day technology cracks that. Uh, number two, I disagree that India is slow in adoption of technology. It is the second fastest uh, growing digital market in the world. The second largest digital consuming, data consuming market in the world. Uh, most number of engineers come out of this country. Uh, the US IT economy depends on this country. We are the VFX backend of the world. We are the IT backend of the world. We will be the AI backend of the world. So I think the adoption will definitely happen. Uh, you know, the big force of the IT world are also based, based here. So I think that will happen. The where will that pivot happen on business is the day unit economics is being found out. And the way we figure that out, Sora bhi sasta ho jayega and sab kuch sasta ho jayega <laughs> and we will use it and it will make business sense. And I, and I don't think uh, people don't understand the power of regional content and things like that. It's, it's money, uh, you know, a Hindi guy doesn't understand the, did not understand the power of the Telugu market till they started making, uh, you know, giving them nightmares. <laughs> so I think it is, I think we are all living in this la la land. Uh, so when your numbers fall in place, uh, clearly so, hai. so I'm glad you said that two things, right? Absolutely. The business will always optimize for the bottom line, right? To th but I'm glad you said backend because the question is how do we not become the backend this time, right? I think Vishal has had a point that like there's hardly any like research level breakthroughs that are Indian, right? And again, at the most, it's seeming like we'll be like consumers of chat GPT and mid journey. How do we, you know, sure, maybe we're not building that tech right now, yeah. but even at a cultural level, how do we kind of really percolate it down so that we're not doing the back end or we're not doing the third wave of like, just speaking from experience, right? A lot of the 
conversation around AI art internationally is very prolific. No one's really talking about India. I mean, I've exhibited in Milan once, but that was almost like, in hindsight, it feels like a fluke because all the conversation yet again is, okay, who are the artists in New York or London or, and that's because we're not making that big cultural push as, hey, look, we're not a nation that understands tech at the back end level. We're shaping the narrative, right? I think that's important. Second, absolutely, the business would optimize maybe too fast. What I'm asking is that, what about the people left in the lurch? What about the, the light data on set who, you know, once you're doing a lot of production on a computer, a lot of that physical production will simply not happen. So I think my question was more about how do we make sure that we don't, disruption, I'm not a fan of the word necessarily, but there is a transitive sort of transition period. In that transition period, how do we make sure that jobs that are most likely going to be lost are maybe upscaled, transferred into new domains? I think that's what we have to think about. Um, Mm-hmm. So human to human interaction will always be there. As a content creator or whoever, right? You are going to be supervised with someone, right? You're going to take some tasks, right? And there's a subjective part of like what is good, which still rests on the human, right? So that will never go away. And coming to uh, like as you mentioned, like the spot data or the the lowest, like the people who are like at the ground level, yes, upscaling is needed, but also sometimes like this technology can open up avenues. Like there can be a reverse domino effect. Some things which are not tested out right now with the advent of AI, like for example, uh, let's talk about language dubbing. There are a lot of uh, series or movies which are lying on the shelf, it's in English, right? But then the movie Heartland or whatever audience doesn't get that. Suppose that is converted using AI as a testing ground. Maybe tomorrow it gives the avenue to have a dedicated budget for that. So it could open up a lot of things also, which we do not see as a starting point because we are still restrictive that, you know what, my job will go away. That is one. Second thing is also, I feel that some things would become like a marketplace. Like, for example, if I am giving my voice, uh, can it be recorded at some place for this much price and like whoever is consuming it will give me some royalty out of it. Right? Right. So these channels will open up, but these channels will not open up on day one. It is like a progressive thing. And also you need to adapt to it. Like how open are you to kind of go into this kind of uh, playing ball. So I think that is like a two-fold thing. It will not happen just from the tech side. It could happen from the industry or whoever is like at that level contributing. Uh, and yeah, and I feel already people are using this kind of tech in the industry in different, uh, what do you call, not in a complete automated sense, but they are using it in a human in the loop sense. So meaning uh, they are using some software which gives you say some translation uh, for subtitling, for example. Mm-hmm. But it's not good. It's not colloquial. So you kind of tweak it, right? Over the time, it will be kind of being used, right? So I think then the uh, the person who's like uh, in charge of the work, it will become more proofreading or supervision. And at the same time, you right. work on 10 different projects. Got it. Assistive tech, right? Yeah. Sorry, uh, just in the interest of time, very quickly, I think we do want to keep some time for questions. So what we'll do now is just... Uh, what we wanted the session to also be is to have some very specific like takeaways. So what I'm going to ask each of you all to do, b- super brief. Guys, like clap and all guys. What yeah. Okay, uh, so what? Let's let's do this, like 60 second takeaways for just everyone in the audience that you would say that hey, if you're interested in this tech or are you in this business or looking to enter it, this is what you should do. Go, 60 seconds. Okay, so from a creator perspective, I think what uh, Smriti said, be curious, keep learning, that's obviously in order to stay relevant. Uh, Also, one important point to what he had said earlier, what I would say, and to your point again, all these job losses, et cetera, are also somewhere cherry picked facts. Because while certain jobs are getting lost, certain others are getting created, as he mentioned. I'll give my own son's example. We were pushing him to come and watch Avatar the other day in the theater. And he was like, I don't want to come for a $300 million budget film. I would rather watch three hours of YouTube, which is being made on home cameras. So now imagine those 300 million getting distributed to creators. 
how much content can it generate it can it generate in that sense so that means those losses jobs would be gone so you never know depending on what is dished out of you or at you be prepared that's at an individual level businesses yes we sit in comfortable offices and keep complaining we need to be a little bit more i don't think as a society we embrace the idea of democratization in its truest sense we want to say armchair democratization but i should get my seven figure salary uh, we should change that mindset i'm sorry if i'm uh, you know kind of digressing from the topic but ai is going to force us to do that in some way and the more content we are with that idea i think we'll be able to cope up better and obviously then focus energies on learning understanding the business get those seven figures right great right uh, so as individuals i think the first thing you need to do is learn and create Uh, if you're genuinely interested in using it to be a creator because you'll keep putting content out there and you'll keep getting feedback and you'll understand what is it what is going to work and what is not going to work number 2 build an audience again if you're a creator build an audience with that ai content uh, ai generated content that you're creating because that is where the pivot will really happen it is not the skill it is a reach skill is great it is reach you know you have great actors who don't have box office hits that's because they not have reach right so that's number 2 if you are an entity or a business uh, please understand how you can use ai to optimize cost understand unit economics and adopt it the day you are able to crash it because i think i mean we have about 300 team members and i think to, i mean 20 of them spend a lot of time creating C, like cgi content right they spend three times more time uh, you know rather than in a rudimentary software so i think that's where the pivot is you need to understand that if this is able to one bring my unit economics down help me scale and help me be more efficient that's when you as an organization needs to start adopting ai and of course you should do it because you will eventually if you don't do it now you'll be forced to do it right so yeah i think uh, i think most of it is already said but uh, as i mentioned it's an assistive tech so don't worry about it replacing people or and there is like fear and there is also hype so don't believe that because the real questions will always get buried otherwise uh, and yeah adopt like this technology because it's kind of nascent yet uh, it's like not designed for example the indian uh, languages it's still not there in place uh, so the sooner you adopt right now it's like a good to have soon it will become a must have right so the sooner you kind of adopt or try it out and then while trying out you will also figure out what are the limitations of this tech so then that hype or the fear that you have that will automatically go away because you then you are in a position to realize you know what only x works y doesn't work i still need to give some input or i need to still subjectively evaluate it uh, so that is one and i think uh, i feel uh, one more thing uh, that's kind of missing in the indian uh, scenario and i i think i had put put that in my slides as well uh, in the uh, like the european or the uh, the world there is a lot of uh, stakeholders that are getting together so for example uh, people from business people from tech startup whatever uh, researchers academia uh, policy makers legal people they get together uh, in the form of workshops at top peer reviewed conference and stuff where they actively discuss on a lot of topics so automatically the concerns of each person from different fields are brought uh, out and then like there are solutions to mitigate a lot of stuff right so even if you look at like these uh, models like uh, and i think recently there was a fiasco with gemini and all that right uh, so how do you handle bias how do you kind of make sure that uh, marginalized communities are represented well so these kind of questions will never come up unless you kind of uh go away from the fear and hype so i feel panels or discussions like these are a starting point but if they are continued at a much wider scale i feel the right issues will come out uh, which is much needed so we'll be more proactive rather than reactive excellent so, yeah. thanks thanks for this guys uh okay super quickly asad how much time do we have for questions 7 minutes okay guys so let's let's keep it to questions only no comments just uh sir please good evening to all my name is pratap borapati uh, we see a, in the starting of any movie so that no animal is uh, exploited like that we in future we may get no ai is used in the movie are, are you asking that's likely to happen 
that's what they may put no ai use while producing this movie so it may happen in future there is there is a possibility although already all movie making has some level of ai baked into all tools but i think there's an emerging sentiment that what is the opposite of this kind of ai produced thing so there is a interest and a movement towards handmade art ha- again so people will you know how you have uh, music on spotify and then you have vinyl records that you can own there will be a similar movement towards that but i think it'll be a smaller kind of niche interest based market yeah uh, i miss one thing so i'm asking you guys about it you know when you talk about reimagining cinema i think the entire tone is really i wouldn't say defensive but half and half where's the big imagination of what you can do with this stuff that you could never do before as a creator you know basically the restraints on your creativity that were imposed by say having to get a crowd of 100,000 people you got it up it with CGI and now you have 100,000 people what is it in your opinion any one of you with this that's going to free creators up and test if you will the absolute limits of making cinema uh, any one of you I, i just did hear that through the r and half so that's why i was hello yeah so basically now everyone has a studio in house so you can write then you can have a character animated so you can build the whole story for doing that earlier you need to maybe approach a studio get people on board and all that right so that is definitely shifted right so in terms of Yes yes so i think the assumption was like everyone is on boarded to that i'm sorry if that yeah yeah no you're right wrong. you're sir yes i don't think i'm insulting that we talked about this before given the talent of the people there you know there's a lot of people that are involved there 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 people that are involved and that's kind of what the popular understanding is so given that how do you know once upon a time that was exciting now if everyone can do that that's less exciting so it's a, you have to figure out okay where does that go if everyone's making something as big as harry potter it's not so special right so i think what we're trying to navigate is that how do you preserve some of that versus some of the other challenges but that's a excellent point absolutely and you should you should okay. yeah please absolutely sorry uh, sorry i have to ask a question is there is there a filmmaker in the house just just a question i i see one that's why yeah there's pl- you know it'll be very interesting to ask mr gosh uh, uh you know what he thinks about individual creators making great content uh with, uh without i mean just making great content and then the paraphernalia around it maybe that's a great off the cuff discussion but i think you know it will answer a lot of your question you know because i think imagination is imagination that is great but there are so many moving cogs in a in a great successful cinema uh, which i think it's a large discussion to have some day right no so i i didn't get to what no, specifically no, no, no. i said question. maybe it's a conversation off the cuff for yeah, sure yeah, but I think let's yeah, yeah yeah of course let's it's just a great conversation off the cuff let's just figure out if there are any other questions yeah. questions yeah. questions yeah. okay hello everyone So my question is, OpenAI has introduced Sora. That is like we give prompt to that, and it will give us some videos. So in future, if it is going to release, in future, if it is to release, so how it will impact the cinema world? Oh, okay. So that that's what the panel was about. But do you, I think you are asking how will how will something like Sora would impact the cinematic world, right? I mean. I mean that's really what we're discussing. What we're saying is human imagination is right on top. These are all enablers that will make you either reduce cost, reduce time, be more efficient, and be more creative. But the fact remains that even today you need a Steven Spielberg yeah. to think of an avatar, right? So we're saying that that remains, but he'll just probably makes uh, avatar in quicker, cheaper, faster, right? <laughs> and maybe right. maybe that's what will happen, right? And also, it's not. It doesn't mean that the people currently making avatar are not doing anything yeah. because. they also have that tech so they can do that much more sorry uh, yeah there okay just uh, solon for a sec yeah let's please 
Yeah, uh, my question is, are there any industry standards as such for AI's implementation in media and entertainment? For instance, for transcription, translation, or any kind of creation that defines the threshold of quality. Uh, are there any standards, even rough drafts as such? So maybe I can take that. I think the workflows and tools are still emerging. You don't have a you don't have an Adobe of AI yet, if that makes sense. You don't have certain file formats yet, which are industry standard. Um, a lot of the media that's coming out is still getting put into like Final Cut Pro or Photoshop or whatever. There are, I did a slide at the beginning, there are a bunch of tools. Um, some of them have started becoming like industry standards. You could say something like Mid Journey is kind of close to industry standard right now. But given the possibilities of these tools, the real value creation is actually building your own custom workflows, especially given the fact that they rel rely so much on data. So the real workflows will be very almost like proprietary, where companies with that kind of data and that kind of technical know-how will build very specific custom AI workflows like Disney's already doing at scale. I think that that kind of arrangement will probably be the industry standard. You've got, anyone's got a point of view? So basically, if you talk about just transcription, like you generally evaluate with a human gold standard, right? So suppose the text you have is a ground truth and whatever the machine gives. So you evaluate it word by word. There's like di different scores, like that's on the technical side. So right now it's more of a consumer thing where people are like hand, like correcting it and all that. There's no score or a benchmark that, you know what, this tool should pass, surpass this number or whatever, right? But yes, as and when like it's more adopted, people will come that, you know what, uh, with this tool, I'm at least getting like 80% accuracy or whatever, right? So as of now, it's not there because it's not designed for that. It's like a one size fits all. But as and when it's like for a particular, I don't know, script or whatever, then it will right. surely come. Okay, up. sorry, just last question. So basically, I have a question around personalization. So we've spoken about languages. But how do you see personalization from a story perspective? Because I feel like video games and films can merge and VR as well. So what is your view on that? No, absolutely. I think immersive cinema is definitely something that, that is around the corner. Uh, we've got to 5D, 7D and all those sh you know, chair shaking and water falling. Yeah. So we are there, very rudimentary. But I totally agree. There is uh, Tomorrow there is going to be a film where you're going to see a hunter hunting somebody and you'll be standing next to a deer and you're feeling it and it's the dome where you're seeing the sky on top and there's probably an elephant running behind you. Definitely that's something that's gonna happen for sure. There will be immersive cinema where you'll be sitting inside a theater and experiencing it like nobody's business. Yeah, yeah like uh, the holodeck is coming. If you've seen but Ready but Player One, uh, that's where we're headed. If, if we don't end right now, we'll be hunted out of this place. Uh, but you know, uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, it was an incredible session. I mean, I'm so excited that this was a third of our series where we looked at, uh, at various parts of the arts from literature now to uh, to cinema and the, the, the next uh, edition is going to be on the visual arts so your work could be, could actually reach uh, New York it actually does reach New York and then a lot of it is happening but anyway uh, thank you for being here thank you uh, Vishal, Smriti, Hare Krishnan and Dev Datta for uh, all your insights I, I feel I've learned a lot, a lot from this panel I don't know about y'all guys and Pratik for so skillfully moderating the session I think you did the you crossed over to the dark side now, you know. Um, so, um, and thank you to our partners, the NGMA, uh, uh, Umesh ji and Shruti for hosting us. We have a lot more of our panels and programs planned. You just have to stalk us on social media or and, and then also follow him as he wants to. And, uh, or check out our website. Thank you for being here in such great numbers. We've had many actually 